Hi, good morning. Hi, everybody, and thank you all for coming. Uh, thank Charlie Giannone from Channel 17, who's with us today. My name is Sandy Baird, and I am one of the founders of the Vermont Institute of Community and International Involvement, which is a group that started about a year ago to provide community discussions, to provide uh, information about critical issues facing our country and our state and our city. We meet every Wednesday night and we present some kind of a community discussion on, on a lot of issues. For instance, on Wednesday, on Thursday night, tomorrow night, we're going to have a discussion of the court packing or the court expansion the U.S. Supreme Court, um, and we will have a community discussion about that tomorrow night uh, on Zoom at 6 o'clock. But I'm here today to express Vicki's solidarity with the faculty, the staff, and the students of the University of Vermont um, and their uh, position that the college, our university, the state university, should continue to support and expand the liberal arts and humanities courses and majors at the University of Vermont. Vicki believes, as does all the citizens of our state, that the only way to educate a complete human being and a complete human being at all ages is to provide education, teaching, and learning in the liberal arts that foster critical thinking, creative expression, uh, an engaged citizen, and to create free citizens in a democratic society. So with those, with the faculty, with the students, and with the staff of the University of Vermont, we urge the university to halt the cuts in the liberal arts and in the humanities and to rethink their position and to support those programs uh, in the liberal arts and in the humanities and all the faculty who teach in those programs. So welcome here this morning. We're going to have a discussion of this issue. I'm going to turn over this microphone to Megan Emery, who is a French professor here at the university and who has been very active in supporting the liberal arts and the humanities. Thank you and welcome and I'm so happy to see you all here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandy, and I'm very happy to be here, too. I want to give Sandy a proper introduction. She did tell you a little bit about a lot of what she does. Here's more. Um, she is an avid student of European history with Professor Andrew Buchanan at UVM, a colleague I know well. She's also a former state representative from Burlington, the UVM district. She's a lawyer and educator, in addition to being a founder of Vicki and the People's Law School. And of course, she is committed to, to civil rights, as we see here today. The next speaker that I'd like to call here, just be careful of, of the cords, is Helen Reilly. She is my colleague on the South Burlington City Council, but she has a long, illustrious career of service to this state and to this institution. She graduated from UVM from education in 1972. She's a former state representative for Burlington, former state senator for Chittenden County, and a former legislative trustee for the University of Vermont. She is also the past executive director of Champlain Valley Area Health Education Center. It is my honor and pleasure to welcome Helen to the microphone. Thank you. Well, good. I put it all in plastic because it was supposed to be raining. I thought I should plan ahead, but maybe that's what, what brings sunshine. But good afternoon, and I appreciate the opportunity to address you. And thank you, Megan, for introduce, including me in such a nice introduction. Let me first start by saying that I'm not representing the South Burlington City Council, nor am I contemplating a run for higher office and here hoping for some support. I am here simply as an individual, a citizen, an alumna, a person who cares deeply about the future of the University of Vermont. My perspectives come from experience as a former, as Megan mentioned, a former UVM trustee elected by the legislature quite a few years ago. 
a Vermont middle school teacher of US history, government, and world history, and 20 plus years as a Vermont legislator. It seems to me that the current administration's action and plans for the future do three things detrimental to this institution and this state. The plan strays from the promises and expectations of a land-grant university, which is important to the state. It undermines the foundational teachings important to a rigorous democracy, which is important to everyone. And three, challenges the ability to provide development of an ethical foundation for our students' careers and life endeavors to bring humanity back into the equation, or rather keep it there. Again, important to everyone. So number one, straying from the land-grant university goals certainly could be problematic for the state of Vermont. We all know Vermont is a small state, a community really, given its size. We depend on each other for all manner of things. We seem to embrace the democratic spirit perhaps more than many other states. We depend on the promise of a land-grant institution to provide the research, intellectual foundation, and stimuli for all manner of things, agricultural best practices, water quality, the importance of forest blocks, education, special education, social services, mental health and primary care physicians and providers, cleaning up Lake Champlain, smart growth, historical preservation, climate change, nurses, technicians, the list is longer. As a legislator, we look to UVM as our flagship and partner for assistance in addressing the multitude of issues important to us all. Where would we go if UVM couldn't help? Who knows and understands this state best? If you stray from that relationship, eliminate the courses critical to addressing those issues, you fail to meet the basis for land-grant institutions, and you're no longer really the University of Vermont. You can become a, you, you can become a university for somebody else and just happen to be located in Vermont but that would be tragic. Number two, a true university offers students the foundational teachers, the teachings for a rigorous and healthy democracy. And heaven knows that is critically important at this moment in our history. Without the broad spectrum of courses offered in the College of Arts and Sciences that are now at risk, students lose an important ability to learn and understand the world. Courses in religion and culture and language and art history, music, provide better understanding and responses to issues we are facing in Vermont, our country, and the world. These are the underpinnings of a, demo a democratic society, an ability to build bridges of understanding. As important to town meetings as to the state legislature and the United Nations. We need diversity of thought and understanding of what makes people see the world differently. This translates into a shared sense of humanity and is important to our world. Then we can move forward. Without that, we can help put a functioning democracy at risk. And this humanity leads me to my final point, number three. An ethical foundation for careers and life endeavors of our graduates is critical. Again, the all-important courses in philosophy, the classics, ethics, religion, history, literature, all play important roles for successfully graduating future leaders, entrepreneurs, teachers, scientists, healthcare providers, even lawyers, lobbyists, in short, all graduates, and by extension, all Vermont residents. Our state university must provide these opportunities of, of learning. We can't leave it to fate. I understand there's no guarantee that every student 
will become totally ethical, caring, and perfect. But I would like to think that that is an important value still held by the University of Vermont. Let's not renege on our contract with humanity. In conclusion, I understand how difficult it can be for a board of trustees to challenge the goals of a recently constituted administration. They seem to have all the data, and often it is not fully shared in ways that are clear and discernible. It can be complicated. But I implore the trustees and the administration to take a closer look. Listen to the faculty, staff, and students. Consider the consequences of this new vision in the broadest sense and do the right thing. Rethink this and get back to what is best for Vermont and the students. Thank you for this opportunity to share my thoughts and for your interest and persistence. I wish us all success. Thank you so much, Helen. And you see why South Burlington and indeed the region is so lucky to have her at the helm of municipal and, and local and regional government. She spoke of the... Not on UVM campus. Yeah, the campus is a little bit. I will do so. And feel free to, to just raise a hand to an ear to let the speaker know, all right? Very good. Well, thank you again, Helen. And I wanted just to repeat what she said that a liberal arts education is something that is called a contract with humanity. I love that expression. Applause, yes. You coined it here, Helen. <laughs> and let us not forget that our republic is founded on a social contract. And that social contract is with our citizens, including our new citizens. And that is why we have invited the next speaker to our podium. And I hope I'm pronouncing, is it Abijah? Abhija Manga, he is a UVM PhD student in education, Department of Leadership and Policy Studies. He's the owner of Loving Home Care in Colchester. He's a teacher, interpreter, youth program coordinator with AALV, former outreach coordinator for CVOEO's Fair Housing Project, MHFA, Save the Children, and past foreign affairs expert for the office of the Prime Minister of the Congo. Yes. <laughs> we have a distinguished list of speakers. Here comes the truck, so please wait. And might I add that he is a living example of that social contract that all new Americans make with this great democracy. Thank you. Thank you, Abhija. Thank you. Hi, everybody. You will see that I didn't uh, write a very long speech, but I just wanted to be here to support this cause. Why? It's because I am a living experience of why I think education is important, not only for all of you, but also for new Americans who have chosen America to be their homes, especially Vermont. You, as you may know it, you know that Vermont is one of the resettlement states, and we have so many immigrants, and most of them are refugees, and I work with refugee students. When they're in high school, a lot of them want to come to UVM. So many of them want to go to college. But if we are hearing that some fund will be cut, we actually jeopardizing even their hope. They will not even have hope to pursue what is in our constitution 
to pursue the better life. So I didn't want to write a lot because I believe that education as a public good, all of us need to benefit from that. And it doesn't, as I said in the beginning, benefit a lot to new Americans. And as a new American, I believe that we need to support this cause. Because by supporting this cause, we show not only to Americans, but to other people around the world that this country is really a true democracy. And we're supporting education as a public good. We're supporting our citizens by giving them what is needed. If they can't get education, especially liberal art, because I'm in the liberal art, we're showing that we're actually stopping them to move forward. There's a greater competition around the world. So to you all, I just wanted to tell you, th to thank you first for coming today and to showing that you're supporting this cause. So thank you again for giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much, Abisha. And I do want to say that he accepted only on Monday, okay? And actually, I, I reached him on Monday and he accepted yesterday because a previous speaker needed to change plans due to an unforeseen event and just remarkable generosity. Thank you, thank you. The next speaker is Julie Roberts, who I know quite well as a colleague. She is a professor of linguistics and she is our very much appreciated and beloved United Academics president who has just served to us a ratified contract for full-time faculty. <laughs> Yes, we are happy about that. Thank you. Um, please step forward if you can't hear also. Um, and I will do my best to project. I want to talk to you today about how not to run a university during a pandemic or other global emergency based on the example of UVM. One, reduce the job and pay of many of the least paid and most job insecure faculty by one quarter. Then, after they've spent the summer worrying about how they're gonna pay for housing and food, and when you realize you actually need those faculty to teach classes, change your mind. Two, cut the salaries of staff who are without the protection of a union by 5%. Then, when you realize you can't make the budget crisis argument work anymore, and you can't give the same cut to unionized employees because there is no budget crisis, change your mind. Three, do not renew the contracts of three senior lecturers with over 20 years experience each and bend over backwards trying to explain that it's not real, really a layoff, but rather it is normal to reevaluate what courses are needed as contracts come up for renewal. And besides, we're in a budget crisis. Then when it turns out that many more students than expected or planned for put down deposits for the fall, and you desperately need faculty to teach them, change your mind. Only this time, don't offer them the four-year contracts to which they are entitled, but reduce the offer to two years. Why? I have no idea. Fin four, finally, announce cuts to programs, departments, majors, and minors, because maybe we're in a budget crisis, or maybe we're fiscally sound, but units with few majors are unsustainable no matter how many students they teach and what their impact is on the state of Vermont. Then when your decision comes up against the well-established processes of shared government through the Faculty Senate, coerce those programs into dissolving themselves by hiding their faculty and classes under the protection of larger units. Why? I have no idea. I want to talk about briefly how we got here. The UVM Board of Trustees decided to approve the hiring of the current president, ignoring all past practices and their own stated process by bringing him in as the only candidate without faculty or other UVM community support. Having made this decision, they now back the current administration, despite the harm they are doing to UVM in general, and particularly to our ability to deliver a quality liberal arts education. What is the solution? 
One, there are undoubtedly many, as you will probably hear today, but I want to talk about one in particular. Diversify and democratize the Board of Trustees. Add the experience, <laughs> add the experience and the perspectives of those who know what is going on day in and day out at UVM, our faculty and staff. Add both faculty and staff members. We at, in United Academics have promoted a bill which has been introduced into the Vermont House of Representatives to do just that. However, if the board decided to go ahead and do what is right for UVM and for the state on their own, how much better would that be? I don't think they would need to change their minds. And lastly, fully restore the jobs of the three cut senior lecturers. Two year recall appointments are not enough. These beloved faculty deserve their full contracts back. We can turn this around. We celebrate the students who have chosen to return to or come to UVM for the first time. We celebrate the faculty whose amazing teaching and scholarship has made UVM the kind of place where students want to come. And we celebrate the staff who make this education possible. We celebrate our unions, which have worked harder than ever this year to support these faculty and these staff and these students. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. She is one of the pillars up here, right? Also a former faculty senate president, in addition to all that she does for our university. The next speaker I'd like to call up is Eric Lindstrom, who is a professor of English. He is also a member of the United Academics Executive Council as a member at large, I believe. Thank you, everybody, for coming out to Vicki, my colleagues in the union, community members. I'm here as the secretary uh, of United Academics, a member of the Executive Council, and also on my own behalf to talk to you about something that concerns everybody here, all the members of our university community and citizens of the state that UVM administration really doesn't want us to know or talk about, and that is the increasing normalization and the dollar amounts of UVM admins' relationships with private consulting firms. Um, you know, this is critical in a public institution. And uh, I, I'm an English professor. I was just promoted to the rank of full professor two weeks ago. I'm proud of that. I earned it. I've been here for 15 years. I was a member and then chair of the Fletcher Free Library Board. I've got two kids in the Burlington school system. I want to be proud of staying here, and I want my kids to have a good option to come to UVM. And uh, I'm happy to be here with my colleagues and friends, but reluctant. You know, I'd rather be in the community garden or doing some research after finishing class last night uh, at 8 o'clock. This issue came to the fore back in 2007, maybe, in a kind of scandal, really when a member of UVM administration, chief financial officer, without authorization spent, I think, minimum $5 million that wasn't authorized by the board or the then president, Dan Fogel, my colleague whom I respect, um, $5 million on a PeopleSoft software implementation. That, that was a scandal. And also I'll say it was for it was for a product, you know, it was for something that we do use, however uh, kind of ghastly that was. What I want to talk about today is just kind of the normalization since then, 2007, right before the financial crisis, of kind of day-to-day -day operations, right, with private consulting here at UVM and, and broadly across the nation. Um, I, I will admit I don't have a real personal comprehension or like of management culture in the academy. I'm a romanticist and I teach in the English department. I'm allowed to have a kind of constitutional, you know, gap there. But we are a public institution. And when we make a Freedom of Information Act request, certainly we deserve public information. And you all should know what our state school is spending 
um, and what they're doing it for. So the issues I have are multifold, really. One is the amount of money. In kind of, again, not a scandal, I'm not trying to blow a whistle today. Day-to-day -day operations we just filed, given the uh, austerity measures on campus, a request to see how much a request to see how much UVM administration had been paying to the private consulting firm Huron, who you can Google this, I mean, I just did last night, whose CEO, I believe, makes $4 million annually, and I think whose CFO makes $2 million annually. I don't want to be quoted on that, but I Googled it, so it's there. Um, and since 2016 and ending in 2021, it was just under $4 million. 3 million nine hundred thousand thirty three four hundred eighty eight dollars and sixty three cents eventually after a request that was filed I'll just give the dates and I mean again I'm not trying to say anything exceptional is going on here but it's characteristic a FOIA request was made on behalf of United Academics January 29th 2021 which makes the mutually acknowledged date to get back to us, 10 business days, February 12th. We got some lagging and kind of kicking it down the road and some requests for deferral. It was answered uh, eventually with a set of 17 redacted documents that are posted to the United Academics website on March 12th, so a month after the 10-day protocol. Both the time needed for UVM's offices to prepare these documents and the time needed for Huron, the private consulting group, to prepare those documents were invoked as reasons for the delay, right? At that time, so this is March 12th, one reason for the highly redacted, you know, blacked out documents was cited as Huron's, quote, trade secret rights as a private company to protect their trade information around their proprietary products, right? Um, what concerns me here, and I don't have an answer for it, but I feel like it's a big question that requires real community participation to address uh, here in Vermont and across the nation, is how our state public universities can have private consulting relationships that are not disclosed and that are legally protected as trade secrets, even when such information, at least initially, includes basic things like the dollar amount of the contract. Um, again, I, you know, I'm not in law either or management. That seems like a big issue to me and an important issue. And it's not often that you sort of feel that little thrill in your bones of knowing you're a citizen and you have to do something. But I really do feel if we don't think together about this in 10 years, 20 years, 40 years, this kind of consulting relationship, which again, I'll acknowledge my, it, my position, feels to me parasitic, feels to me opportunistic, feels not motivated by the better good of our state, our university, um, is gonna grow over our campuses and wipe out elements of our campus ecology like Dutch elm disease did in the 20th century to our trees. I mean, I think we'll look out and our institutional landscape will be different. Uh, I'm really worried about that. I can't even necessarily formalize, you know, my thoughts about what that will look like, but I think we need to act. And I don't just think it's about UVM. I think it's business as usual. Other schools that this uh, consulting firm Huron has worked with are, interestingly, great schools. My alma mater, University of Wisconsin-Madison, to make them more efficient and flexible. The new school, you know, like my colleague in grad school that was smarter than me, he teaches there. These are great schools. New Hampshire, our colleague and peer institution. These are all great universities, and the fact that there are peer institutions are better does not comfort me. Um, so broadly, I'm here to express my concern, not just about one FOIA request, which is important and should be heeded and should be um, respected in the function of our university and the state, 
but also more broadly in terms of UVM's ongoing relationship with consulting firms. While I'd acknowledge that outside consulting relationships on some scale are probably a necessary part of life in today's academy, I mean, UVM brings in some people to consult and we pay them 100, 1,000, couple thousand. They help us out. We know them, we name them. You see them on the street. They live here. What I see here increasingly across the country are moves from a corporate playbook and could spread like a disease. And we're seeing it start, certainly in the last decade. Because of the amount of money being spent, the compound factor that whatever money is spent is being sent by, spent by higher administration that we're already paying a lot, they should do those jobs. They should have those visions. They should do the reimagining. We pay $4 million for reimagining and we don't pay for the imagining of an English department instructor. Um, two, because of the near complete lack of transparency, even when pressed by such means as the public does have. And three, from the sense, which I truly feel and don't want to feel collectively, that our administration seems increasingly to value and plan alongside professional management firms in consulting, not with faculty, not with students, not with citizens. Even when UVM faculty, students, staff, and Vermont citizens are brought on board, it seems to be more about hollow gestures of process and not about substance, which has already been set. Um, that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, and congratulations on becoming a full professor. Bravo. I just wanted to add um, that we all are in the midst of finalizing the semester and, and we are looking forward to being free. But before we get to that freedom, which includes perhaps we hope freedom from wearing the mask, we have exams right ahead of us here. And so I am really grateful to the students who have now joined us, as well as the faculty, including emeritus, who are here. This is a busy time, and we very much appreciate your presence. I just wanted to add, too, something about Huron Consulting. They not only work with higher education institutions, they work with right-wing politicians, including Ted Cruz of Texas. It's perhaps not a coincidence that the great University of Wisconsin was decimated under its previous governor, Scott Walker. I just want us to think about that a little bit. And I want us to also think about a sales pitch that came out under the title of COVID Insights in December of 2020, just a few months ago, highlighting UVM as one of Huron's clients. Huron is associated with breaking tenure. It's associated with downsizing the liberal arts. And so I want us to just think about that a little bit, about with whom our administration is contracting. I'm the next speaker. <laughs> and I am an associate professor of French. I've been here for 19 years. Um, I'm here because Sandy Baird reached out to me and said, I belong to this incredible association named Vicky, and we want to know what's happening at UVM. Please come talk to us, along with Senator Phil Baruth, which I did back in March. And, and Julie joined us at a subsequent session in, in was it April? Yeah. Thank you, Sandy. These months are. So what a year, right? And this past year has been traumatic. For many of us here, at the University of Vermont, on the faculty and equally the staff and students, just as it, has, as it has been and continues to be for people all over, you might say, so get over it, right? And who doesn't like or even vicariously benefit from compelling drama these days? Well, to the naysayers, I say, let's get past the entertainment value, shall we, and spin that's happened in the administration statements and press releases. Because, and I hope you hear me when I say this, this is serious business. The interests of our future, your future and our future are at stake. 
As we follow developments led by faculty, staff, and students over the past few months, followed by last Friday's news of record-breaking deposits from new and coming first-year students, the administration's story of ongoing financial hardship is increasingly hard to take. It's a fiction. The layoffs that Julie spoke of, unnecessary. And our dean and his staff are now scrambling to reconstitute our shrunken faculty ranks. You've seen the numbers. More than 200 students net are expected to exceed institutional projections, and this is for the College of Arts and Sciences alone. 300, more, 300 students net for the university overall. In our college, in addition to layoffs, we are facing severe attrition, with 30 more faculty in the arts and sciences planning to retire in the coming years. On top of 18 full-time tenured faculty, 10 non-tenure track full-time equivalents, and 62 part-time faculty that we've lost through attrition and cuts since 2018. Do the math. And as Julie Roberts stated, last semester's layoffs were made in the cruelest of ways. With little warning, during the week of final exams, just as winter was setting in and faculty seeking to recharge with their families over the end of year holidays, after a grueling three months of cleaning protocols for in-person classes or the challenges of adapting to hybrid or remote instruction, Charlie Briggs, Jamie Williamson and Stephen Wright combined taught more than 550 students last year alone. They were tired and deserved a thanks and needed rest. They certainly did not deserve to be unceremoniously dismissed and shown the door. Brian Walsh of Classics and Anis Memon of French and Italian didn't deserve this treatment either when their contracts weren't renewed two or three years prior. Due to a non-existent budget crisis, more widely broadcast as a structural deficit, both of which terms top administrators have now disavowed. And now they're claiming a revenue shortfall, probably a creative play on our tuition freeze, which I'm, I approve of, but it's not a tuition revenue shortfall, let's just be clear. None of us deserve this Orwellian shock treatment. Plus, when you're only four years shy of retirement, as in Jamie's case, or the father of a young family, as in Anissa's case, it is inordinately shocking to hear university administrators cry poverty when they give themselves $1 million in raises and bonuses at the same time they claim to save $600,000 as justification for closing 27 programs, 12 majors, 11 minors, and four master's programs. That's $600,000 of savings compared to a million. And that's only in the arts and sciences, and particularly the humanities. And we're a land-grant university, Vermont's flagship institution of higher learning, and a premier research institution. Even teaching and research excellence did not save our male colleagues from what Naomi Klein has coined as disaster capitalism. This unforced and yet foreseeable human and institutional catastrophe has created not only a scramble in our dean's office to find faculty to cover needed new course sections, but also the past year, a deadly climate of fear particularly among non-tenure track and untenured faculty, faculty of color, LGBTQ plus faculty, and faculty in small programs such as mine in French. Although the administration is now offering our non-tenure track faculty a full, full-time load of classes and the modest salary that goes along with it, these same faculty have seen written into their contracts the ominous redefinition of full-time equivalency as 0.75 FTE, or 75% of a full teaching load. This Damocles sword 
of losing a quarter of one's barely livable wage. Perhaps the sole income for a single mom's household as non-tenure track faculty Rachel Montesano in Spanish taught us last fall is barely tenable for an institution. I can't let them roar over this. these salaries by 25% is untenable for an institution that prides itself on our collective commitment to respect, integrity, innovation, openness, justice, and responsibility, or what we call here our common ground principles. And as a professor teaching in a relatively small language program, though our numbers are impressive in comparison to our peers, it was not without hesitation that I chose to speak up as one among a loose coalition of faculty, staff, and students, and community members known as UVM United Against the Cuts. However, once the ice was broken after the first press conference back in March, I, and indeed we, remain firmly committed to restoring the liberal arts programming and our faculty ranks so that our UVM, our university, to which we dedicate our lifeblood, can thrive as an institution and provide the quality education promised and bequeathed to us by our forebears, including John Dewey. It was perhaps easier for me as a woman faculty member to accept the invitation to join a more private working group of the Faculty Women's Caucus. Before I even got on board, this amazing group of women had put together a draft survey of 45 questions that was then distributed to the university listservs, serving faculty who identify as women, LGBTQ+, or BIPOC. The results were issued late yesterday. At about the same time, we learned of the ratification of our full-time faculty contract. Representing a subset of women faculty, the results from those who responded, as well as the 20 pages of open-ended responses they wrote, single-space pages, they tell us a story, the story of what shock capitalism does to not only men, but also those among us who feel the most vulnerable, in particular our non-tenure track and untenured faculty and faculty women of color. Respondents from each of UVM's eight colleges with about half tenured and half untenured or non-tenure track shared their assessment of the current campus climate and working conditions. I'm gonna share some quotes with you from the executive summary. Asked to choose from excellent, very good, good, fair, or poor, the situation was rated the worst for BIPOC and non-tenure track and untenured faculty with 89% of respondents, 89% of respondents rating climate and conditions as fair or poor for BIPOC faculty, and 83% rating them fair or poor for untenured faculty. 65% of respondents rated climate and conditions as fair or poor for faculty women overall, and 48% rated them as fair or poor for LGBTQ plus faculty. Furthermore, the women faculty respondents clearly linked the climate to our current administration, and here I quote again. 66% of respondents reported that climate and conditions have worsened for faculty women in the past two years. 85% of respondents reported worsening climate and conditions for untenured or non-tenured track faculty. Listen to these numbers. They tell us a story. Respondents also cited, and I quote, the large negative effect from recent administrative decisions, such as closing the campus children's school and pushing for cuts and academic reorganization in a pandemic. Of major concern is that more than half of respondents seek to leave UVM in the near future with one third attributing their plans, that's more than half, with one third attributing their plans to recent trends at UVM. Respondent comments showed clear dissatisfaction with the current university administration's failure to address campus climate, working conditions, and equity issues that impact the work and lives of faculty women and LGBTQ and BIPOC faculty. So, 
all is not rosy in this picture as the administration would have us believe. On this day when we are to celebrate the ratified contract for full-time faculty after more than a year of brutal negotiations, Julie's tired and she deserves our thanks. The picture this report provides, less. And a rest. And here she is today. The picture this report provides is extremely far from being rosy, which is why I felt compelled to speak about it today. So my thanks to the brave women and men and faculty of all genders who have worked to find ways to have the voices of the most vulnerable heard. May they be. Thank you. All right. Now we turn to the best part, our students. Annalise Holden, are you here? All right. I have to find my notes. I've gotten lost here in all of my pages. Because she's also got some things I need to talk about. All right. This amazing young woman is a rising junior. During her sophomore year, she has been one of the champions of our UVM Union of Students. She has participated in every activity that I have taken part in, including the teach-in, where she spoke so eloquently. She wrote a commentary that appeared in the Vermont Digger. Again, her eloquence was moving. And as professors, we love to see our students shine the way that Annalise shines. She is a classics major. Yes, just like Toni Morrison and Dr. Anthony Fauci. Here we go, Annalise. The world and the stage is yours. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Annalise Holden. Um, I'm a rising junior undergraduate student. Um, I'm studying classical civilization and ancient Greek with a minor in psychological sciences. I would like to share with you all a student's perspective on the latest occurrences within the College of Arts and Sciences. As most of us know, on December 2nd of last year, College of Arts and Sciences Dean William Falls sent a memo in conjunction with Provost Patricia Prelock to propose the termination of 12 majors, 11 minors, and four graduate programs, including the closure of the classics, religion, geology, historic preservation programs, as well as majors and minors in global studies, language, and more. This announcement made in the middle of a remote semester, of finals in the middle of a remote semester, was devastating to students in and outside of these programs, myself included. For six months, I have given a lot of effort to protest these changes, efforts made alongside my heavy academic responsibilities and difficulties coping with the pandemic. I wish I was studying for my finals right now, but I'm here today because this is important. I'm not saying these things to earn pity and I don't regret any of these things that I've done. This past challenging year has been a reality for all of our students. The proposed loss of our academic units and our professors has undoubtedly added to that burden. Fast forward to this month, May 2021. Dean William Falls announced that the latest data for new class enrollments showed that the College of Arts and Sciences expects nearly 200 more students than anticipated this fall. Enrollment is at a dramatic increase UVM wide, but particularly in the College of Arts and Sciences. He estimated that number even after taking into account students that would melt away or put down deposits and not choose to attend UVM in the end. He states, and I quote, that there is clearly greater interest in CAS. Personally, I don't think that great interest went anywhere. In a COVID year where students deferred going to colleges and took gap years for their own mental health and physical safety, it should not have come as a surprise to the UVM administration that new students would be abundant this coming year. 
nor should they have jumped at the chance to close departments they deemed suffering and terminate three lecturers. While the pandemic has caught everyone off guard and halted business as usual, it is not an excuse for hasty decision making. It is poor judgment by ambitious administrators who stake their reputations on quixotic restructurings and initiatives, and students and faculty become the collateral. The thing that perhaps has offended me the most out of all this backpedaling is that Dean Falls offered to renew the contracts of the three lecturers whose contracts he had terminated in December. James Williamson, Charlie Briggs, and Stephen Wright. Let me be clear that I take no offense in the reinstatement of these three. I am overjoyed that their contracts would be renewed and that they are so dearly valued by their students and they will have an opportunity to continue working here. I take serious offense for them, that Dean Falls and the broader administration would end their contracts without second thought and then turn around and ask them to come back. It's discourteous to say the least. Dean Falls also stated that the increase in enrollments shows that students believe in our faculty and all we have to offer. He is nearly correct. I believe in my professors, every single one in the classics department. I believe in the professors and cast that I have had the pleasure to learn with these past two years. I believe in James Williamson, Charlie Briggs, and Stephen Wright, the lecturers who so indecently had their jobs threatened before all of our eyes. But I don't believe in William Falls, I don't believe in Patricia Prelock, and I do not believe in Suresh Garamilla. <laughs> the way that my fellow students and I see it, what has happened here was a surprise to no one. It is a game to administrators and a heartfelt disappointment to faculty, staff, graduates, and undergraduates. This is why I stand behind all of the demands made by faculty and fellow students today as a student of the University of Vermont. They keep us young. They keep us young. And they keep us determined. Our resolve has never been stronger, thanks to our students. So, Dan, Daniel Montonio, he's another amazing student. He was my right-hand guy at the April 12th press conference that we put together. UVM Finance is exposed. Not only did he man the controls, he did all of those charts, all of those slides that we had in that press conference. That's Dan. And he did it on top of being a student and an employee at the University of Vermont. These students have amazing energy. They're an example to us. A Little bit more about him. He's an incoming PhD student in biology, one of our fabulous programs that I know from having met biologists from France attracts international scholars and researchers, and we need to keep this basic sciences program strong. If we let IBB or Huron Consulting dismantle our scientific labs, it will be exponentially more expensive to rebuild them from zero. I want people to hear this. It won't happen. They'll be replaced. So in addition to being an incoming PhD student in biology and an employee, he is also a member of UVM United their union, sorry, of students. And he, just like Annalise, has been at every single event and meeting Saturday afternoon at four o'clock that I have attended since December or January. Look at, fabulous. Thank you. Hey guys, I'm not, Woo! all right. <laughs> I'm not really sure what I'm going to add. Uh, you've already heard from a lot of great speakers that have all shared their lack of confidence in UVM's administration and the idea that the current administration has betrayed the mission and values of the university. Uh, I'm not a student here yet, but I hope to bring a graduate employee voice, a staff voice, um, and I will be a grad student coming in in the fall. 
I arrived in Vermont two years ago and like immediately knew this is where I wanted to stay and continue my education. I spent the last year working in the biology department as a research tech, getting to know my project, my lab, and sort of all the levels of organization above it, how this university comes together. In the meanwhile, I've also seen these cuts go down in real time. Uh, so, and I got the sense, right, that all of the other sort of things that make up the university were slowly decaying as faculty weren't being rehired, and, or yeah, as like, as yeah, faculty weren't being rehired and, you know, departments were essentially let to die. So we're all, we all believe that the administration is leading UVM down a destructive path. And I feel that this path is exemplified by the president's amplifying our impact strategic vision for UVM. And this document was actually basically ratified by the Board of Trustees back in 2020. So I'm gonna read the actual vision statement of the university in full, and it reads, to be among the nation's premier research universities with a comprehensive commitment to a liberal arts education, environment, health, and public service, and I feel like the administration have, has betrayed this vision in a number of ways on each of those four points. So Garamella's vision promises only an exposure to humanities, which I feel is a far cry from a comprehensive commitment to the liberal arts. And how could we be a premier research university if we're cutting whole basic science departments that receive uh, federal funding and have actually been uh, recognized for their teaching efforts on like the undergraduate and master's levels. All by a roll of the dice. How could we be this sort of, this premier university if faculty and staff live in fear of losing their jobs and losing their livelihoods basically. So also in Garamella's vision, he promises to attract more graduate students and uh, from further out, like not just you know, to kind of build sort of a national reputation for the university. How could they expect to do that when graduate students aren't being paid a living wage? So uh, the livable wage standard is no more than 35% of, of salary going to rent. Here for graduate students, once the comprehensive fee is taken into account, it's more like 40%. And we're basically in the bottom like fourth of universities in, in that ratio. Uh, how could we attract uh, good graduate students when there isn't subsidized housing or you know, more support for, uh, for students and you know, valuable employees of the university? Back in 2015, before Garamella's time, but also indicative of this sort of privatization of the university, the graduate student housing they had at Fort Ethan, Ethan Allen was closed uh, and sold off to the Champlain uh, Land Trust. And the reason that they justified that was it's too far away, right? Graduate students don't want to live out in Essex or, uh, you know, Colchester. But in reality, many graduate students today still need to live that far because they can't afford to live here in Burlington. Students on campus feel, uh, face rampant food insecurity as well. And that is due to the essential monopoly that Sodexo, the uh, main service provider of food on campus has. So there isn't opportunities to get fresh, cheap, and local food close to campus. And uh, I'm just gonna close off by talking about UVM's lack of accountability. And I'm gonna talk about the issue of climate. So again, back in uh, 2007, UVM committed to being carbon neutral by 2025 and set multiple milestones along the way. And this plan was aggressively advertised on the university's website, and it's still there to this day that we're gonna be carbon neutral by 2025 and have 100% carbon neutral in thermal energy by 2020, when in reality, there was no intention to keep to these goals. So the university signed on to this commitment and they were actually a charter signatory, um, but there's essentially been no action on it. And when speaking to student activists about this recently, uh, Administrators said that the plan was never binding since it wasn't approved by the Board of Trustees. Um, but it's clear that the Board of Trustees and is setting the agenda and it is not one, right? It is not one that, uh, to, you know, it's not, it's an agenda without this comprehensive commitment to liberal arts, environment, health, and public service. So what is the remedy to this? I don't know. <laughs> 
but I think it starts with reversing these cuts and changing the composition of the Board of Trustees, not only to include Democratic membership uh, for faculty and staff, but also democratically elected representatives of the undergraduate and graduate student body and solidarity between all of these different groups on campus going forward. All right. I think that people are still here online with me. Very good. Okay. Our next speaker is also a student. And I want you to again look at this beautiful building that we're standing in front of here. I talked about Julie being a pillar before. Each of the speakers is a brick, right? Of this structure, of this university that is more than a building or a collection of buildings. It's all of the people who have given so much to build our reputation and the incredible research and knowledge and human potential that comes out of these halls and classrooms. And here again, we have an example, our, our last speaker, David Arndt, who I again got to know thanks to UVM United Against the Cuts. He was in it before I got in it, I think. Uh, because he cares so deeply about the Morrill Act and the land grant uh, act that brought all of these great universities into being. And let us acknowledge that it is on Native American land. So let us acknowledge that fact as well. That was a time that we must, we must hold and understand. David Arndt is a director of a nonprofit. He is also an amazing researcher. <laughs> he has taught me so much about what our administration is doing um, and about what we need to be aware of in terms of potentially future plans uh, as programs are terminated, downsized, and where those monies and all of that investment will flow. More to learn about that perhaps in the coming weeks. For now, I want to turn it over to David Arndt, who is a student here. He takes classes in social work in addition to being a father and I think a, a researcher writing a book, yep. if I'm not mistaken, on, on the Morrill Act and on the land grant institution. David. Thank you, everybody. Can you hear me? Everybody hear me? Okay. No? Louder? Louder? Yeah. Okay. Um, I actually, my main focus wasn't going to be the land grant, but Helen, you brought it up, yes? Uh, without a doubt, Garamella, Garamella is violating the land grant. Uh, within the land grant, first of all, the land grant was established in 1862 by the Vermont Senator Morell who is right here at UVM. And um, there were certain things that Morell wanted. He wanted there to be a strong liberal arts, but he also wanted there to be mechanics and agriculture and sciences, maybe what we'd call STEM today. But Senator Morell was not against liberal arts. And within the federal act, Morell Act, um, he specifically says, that classics and other sciences, science, such as geology, uh, should not be excluded. And with the 19th century definition of classics, you also have religion in there. So it goes against the Morrell Act. Now, the Morrell Act was about giving away land to the states for universities, but it was left up to the state. It was left up to the state to have control and some oversight. And so I find it very puzzling that some of our trustees are legislators, because that seems like a huge conflict of interest. But that's another story. Um, but you, whenever you see uh, uh, President Garamella bragging about uh, land grant universities, uh, it, it's like he embodies it or something. And he likes to talk about Senator Morrell's desk in his office. R remember that he's actually violating He's violating the Morrell Act. So I just wanted to throw it out because Helen mentioned it. 
And this is what I really want to talk about. If I can find it here. I, you know, I go beyond sort of what everybody's saying. I really think that there really is no choice but for Garamella to resign, that we need to be rid of him. And if you want to know why, look at his career over the last 30 years at Purdue. You know, what basically what they did there is they created a defense economy. Okay, Garamella is so tied in with the defense industry. Uh, and he's already brought in grants for military here. And so this should be something that should really concern all Vermonters. I mean, his, vi his vision is totally turning this into a STEM school. That's just his mindset. He's not going to change. There's like no real neg negotiations with someone like this. And if you look at his record, you know, you will see that. Um, now, how many people know that uh, Garamella, President Garamello is involved in a legal case right now? Anyone? Okay, a few people. There was a major research scandal at Purdue in a nutrition camp, all right, where there were 40 assaults, physical and sexual, okay? Garamella was the head of research at Purdue. So the, the, the buck stops with him. Um, this scandal, I, you know what I'd love? People write down Camp Dash and Google it on YouTube because the BBC did a half hour show on Camp Dash from the children, the minors' point of view, and the parents' point of view. And that'll give you an idea of what happened at Purdue and why there's a legal case about Camp Dash coming, why our president of UVM is going to be deposed legally. So how does that look for UVM? How does that look to, for our reputation? I mean, we, we deserve a president who has ethics, yeah, character, integrity, not someone who hides in his ivory tower sending Dean Falls off to, you know, to cut off another head of faculty. So, so this, this uh, I mean, this is really new news. People don't know about this. And the reason the case got slowed down was because of the virus. So the court system shut down. I called the lawyer thinking that it had been settled. He said, no, his evidence is so strong, he wants a jury trial because he really wants him exposed. And I'm happy to provide any of this information so people should check themselves. Don't take my word for it, check yourself. Um, now, what would be the motive in keeping a, uh, a camp where there was sexual assault and physical assault going on? Well, in the middle of the camp, there was a pause because the Purdue police, uh, they wanted it shut down. But then there was a meeting, you know, with the provost and it, Garamella and other characters, they decided to keep it going, despite knowing this. Now, why would they do this? It was part of an $8 million grant. And if they did not complete this study, they would not get the $8 million grant. And it was at the National Institute of Health that Garamella, you know, had a, in his job description, he used to maintain the relationship with the National Institute of Health. So this is all going to be coming out. You'll see this. You will see this in the papers. But I really encourage you to go to YouTube and look up Camp Dash, and you'll just be horrified. Um, other thing is, you know, the direction UVM is going in, just, to, just think of some really accomplished liberal arts scholar. Would you want to come here and teach? You know, would you want to come here and teach with everything going on? No. Now, my daughter was going to go to UVM. Because of all this, my daughter's at Syracuse. Okay, when I saw what was going down here. You know, and once other parents and people realize what's going on, it's going to hurt UVM. It's going to hurt UVM's reputation and credibility. And ultimately, it's bottom line. Um, I 
I mean, there's just so many things. I mean, I've done so much, so much research on Garamella that I feel like I live with them. And one of my reasons here is I'm hoping someone here will be willing to take them on as a roommate. Anyone willing? No, I didn't think so. I'm stuck with them. Um, just to keep this concise, you've all been so patient. I don't want to go on too long. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the liberal arts, they're all about critical thinking. You know, for democracy to work, you have to have critical thinking. It doesn't work otherwise. And, and what Garamel is doing is he's undermining that. He's undermining democracy. There is no democracy at UVM. He's an autocrat, really. There's no democracy. I mean, really, there should be students and faculty on the trustees as part of the trustees. You know, this opportunity right now, I mean, COVID is horrible. They recognize it as an opportunity to transform this university into, into solely focusing on STEM. I don't have anything against the sciences, but sciences without the ability to critical think can be very dangerous. They need to go together. Um, but lost my place. It's a good place to stop. What did I? It's a good place to well, stop. I'll just stop with a quote from uh, John Dewey, who was an alumni here. Actually, two quotes. Um, the value of a college education is not the learning of many facts, but the training of the mind to think, to think critically. All right. And then the last quote I'm going to read, it's a little longer. The most important idea in the genesis of the land-grant colleges and state universities was that of democracy, because it had behind it the most passionate feeling. Social and economic democracy in America means primarily liberty of action and equality of opportunity. The central idea behind the land-grant movement was that liberty and equality could not survive unless all men and women had full opportunity to pursue all occupations at the highest practical level. No restrictions of class or fortune or sex or geographical position. No restrictions, well, the struggle, no restriction whatsoever should operate. The struggle for liberty when carried to its logical conclusion is always a struggle for equality. And education is the most important weapon in this context. Democracy implies intellectual liberty with full freedom to think, write, and speak. It implies an open society without caste lines, giving its members full freedom to move from calling to calling, rank to rank. There's not freedom here at UVM. The faculty can't speak openly about what's going on. They're living in like a reign of terror. You know, so I really, Look up Camp Dash on YouTube. Please do that for me. You know, and if the media would like to ask Garamella about Camp Dash, he won't be able to speak about it because he could be liable for anything that he says in court. That'll be interesting too. So this is going to come out, but this really matters. Like the abuse of minor children is just simply not okay for any reason, shape, or form. You know, in this scandal that happened, you're going to be hearing about it. So. I'm sorry if I was a little scattered, I was a little nervous, but I'm gonna let you all go now. Thank you so much. And really, the faculty has to be united, the students have to be united, and we should use this to create a new vision for UVM that restructures it in a way that brings everybody into it. Really, you know, and Garamella will never get that with Garamella, never. Thank you, David. Thank you. All right, I know that Sandy had uh, somewhere to be at too. She's might likely gone and I've been deputized uh, to, to do the next, the next little bit. I, I just wanted to say that when I did watch that Camp Dash documentary, what came back to me was what occurred last May and June here at UVM when our international students were in emergency housing and the heat was on. It was over 100 degrees in these dorm rooms. And for weeks, 
Our international students were getting no answers to their phone calls or emails and they were sleeping on rooftops. It's that lack of care that comes through that is not UVM. Same thing, green and gold promise, here we are. We all are wearing our masks. We're all being thoughtful and caring towards others. And yet there was a policy that was rashly decided upon and then implemented where we saw suspensions, almost immediate suspensions based on an accusation of violating the green and gold promise. It took 4,000 student signatures on a student petition and the threats of lawsuits from parents for finally our university president to, to act and say, wait, <laughs> this maybe is going a little bit too far. Don't you think he should have acted a little bit more with foresight and, and thought and care prior to that implementation and decision? So to wrap this all up, and there is a speak out if anybody did come here to, to add their voices to ours, and, and quite, quite a rounded discussion it's been. And all of the speakers provide the rationale for our call upon the university and state legislature to meet our demands. And I hold these demands in my hand and I have copies. There are 12 demands of the UVM administration and three demands of the state legislature. That is 15 in all. I'm happy to give this to anybody who would like to see it. I want us to ask them in unison to recognize the role, just as Julie said earlier, the role of the faculty senate, whose constitution and bylaws explicitly authorize the faculty to participate in the selection of the president, not in this case, and to legislate, again, Julie said this, needed change to the structure of the board of trustees. We are extremely concerned by the dismantling of the liberal arts at UVM and by the lack of transparency and decision making that has led to the current climate and predicament as we all scramble to give students instructors. Please keep in mind the upcoming dates. May 20th, that is the date of the last faculty senate meeting of the year. And for the senators, I saw Senator Bailey here just a minute ago, who are here or who are listening, who might watch this on, on TV or on their screens. May 13th, that's tomorrow. That's the last day to submit materials to be reviewed for possible inclusion in the May 20th agenda. The Faculty Women's Caucus is submitting the report based on the survey. June 4th, another date. It's the date of the Board of Trustees meeting. We will be there, and all who wish to have the right to be there. These are open meetings, and we must ensure they are per state law. That is, those are my closing remarks. I, I so thank you for coming out. If anybody would like to come forward and speak, you are more than welcome to. Just show your hand or, or step forward. Very good. Just be careful of the cords. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right, everybody, my name is Marcus. I am a second year PhD student here at the University of Vermont. And like Dan, we've been very much aware of the culture of austerity that Suresh Garamella and his administration have implemented here. And it has affected us to the point where a lot of us, unfortunately, can't take this anymore. I'm gonna hit some of the same notes that Dan hit, but I need to give you all some context as to what this administration is doing to us. We are being denied a living wage. There are three departments of graduate students who get paid a living wage. Everybody else is being denied enough money to eat and to afford housing. 20% of all graduate students at this university are food insecure. We cannot afford to eat. We are spending disproportionate amounts of money on rent. We are thrown into the midst of Burlington's already dismal housing crisis with no support from Garamella or his administration. 
Over the years, his administration have sold off graduate student housing, making the housing crisis even worse. All of us are having issues trying to meet Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We cannot eat and we cannot get roofs over our heads. Now the context that I need to give you is that we have confronted Garamella and his administration in the student government body called Graduate Student Senate. The student government body they allow to exist to give us the illusion of progress, the illusion of change. When we confronted his administration, when we confronted Richard Kate and Cindy Forehand about these issues, these systemic issues that keep us down, they denied our fundamental humanity. Richard Kate called us revenue streams and declined to assist us in any way with allocating money towards rebuilding graduate student housing at this university. We were told that we should be grateful for the money that we have and that we're not paying FICA taxes, which is, you know, something that no full-time graduate student in the country pays. That is not something that they are doing on our behalf. Right? It goes to, it stands to, to reason that in order to actually have research done at this university, graduate students need to be taken care of. We need to be invested in. We are the future of the academic and uh, corporate workforce in, in many respects. And if we can't live you know, under a roof and have food in our stomachs, we are not going to be doing quality work. And this problem has become now so systemic that prospective graduate students at interview weekends across multiple departments are declining to come here to attend this university because these systemic issues are being communicated to them. They're being told to run in the other direction because they will not be able to eat and they will not be able to find housing in Burlington. This needs to change. This is systematic abuse of graduate students that has been perpetuated long before the pandemic but made even worse in the midst of this pandemic. And when Garamella himself was confronted with all of these issues, he simply engaged in victim blaming and told us we spend too much money on organic food and that's why we have a problem with affording rent, food and housing in Burlington. This needs to stop. His culture of austerity needs to come to an end. A plurality of graduate students stand with you, the faculty, in opposing these cuts and opposing this manufactured budget crisis that is being used to keep all of us down. And to any graduate students who hear this, who see this, you need to understand organizing is the only way that we can work together to overcome this culture of austerity. <laughs> student government, thank you. Student government has been fighting incredibly hard to oppose this culture, but unfortunately they do not have the power vested in them to make the systemic change that we need. They have been literally taking the money UVM gives us for you know, building community and solidarity amongst ourselves and instead going to Costco to buy food in bulk to distribute to other graduate students. And while we certainly applaud them for doing that, and we are happy that this is within our means to do, to try and support us in our graduate student communities, this unfortunately is not enough and this is equivalent to a band-aid over a gaping wound. So again, Graduate students, we need to work together to overcome this culture. We need to stand behind our faculty. We need to stand with undergraduates in supporting survivors and calling upon the administration to believe survivors. We all need to work together. And graduate students, you have the power. It's time we start using it. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Sharon Busher, and my name is Sharon Busher. Can you hear me? And I'm a graduate of UVM, and um, actually in clinical laboratory science. So STEM programs are important to me. But what I want to talk about is the fact that that was that gave me a profession. But the classes that I had in liberal arts gave me growth and a means to communicate with other members of society. They touched my humanity. And so to think that STEM is the only th step forward is really ill-fated. STEM and liberal arts need to go hand in hand. They really do. 
and this I hear from all of you, students and faculty, you know, this is what you see as an internal problem, but it isn't. It is a statewide problem. I'm a resident, and I only hear things that trickle out. I don't know all. I've learned a lot today, and I keep learning about what's happening to each one of you, to all of the programs. But it's not okay. We, as residents of Vermont, this is our state university, and we need to hold the members, the Board of Trustees and the President accountable, and we need to have input into the direction that this university is going. You can't make decisions, well you can, in a vacuum, but then they're ill-fated and the outcome is terrible. Now you talked about Her Huron. I worked at the hospital for 50 years and there was a company called West Hudson, outside consultants that come in, do analysis, save money, take their money, and leave you with their findings and usually their findings fall short it leaves a structure in shambles and it takes decades to get out of that and to repair the damage that was done i'm hoping that this can be stopped before all of the damage that huron is going to do to this university because it really what i'm really telling you is that we lost it was the first time the the hospital laid off and fired people and they never fully recovered from that decision it was not the right decision because people from the outside don't know the circumstances don't know the ripple effect nor do they care because they're getting paid so i hear all of you i'm worried about this i want to have a voice i want to help and i think the point of this rally today is to say to vermonters pay attention get in touch with your legislators get in touch, attend virtually, I guess, the Board of Trustees meeting. Let them know that they're going in the wrong direction. And a very important point was made about diversifying the Board of Trustees. Most of those people don't live in Vermont and are so detached that they are making decisions that are only financially beneficial. They aren't decisions that are good for the student body or the faculty or the economic state of Vermont. And I want to say one other thing. If you're a young family here, you might think that your child would go to the University of Vermont. But as you cut and gut programs, you will not have that opportunity potentially you may have to go out of state at an additional cost so I think that all of the things that are happening are those that I'm glad you're giving voice to them I'm glad that channel 17 and Charlie's taping this so that so thank you thank you because I think we need to get this information out to people so they know what is really happening and what we what we could lose. Um, I want to just say one thing. If I, I listened to NPR and they were talking about the importance of geology, especially in the environmental crisis that we're in, and the soil and, and rocks and how that all plays out. Paul Bierman's a professor here. He has made, he is a resource for the state of Vermont, and his observations about stormwater runoff and how that impacts the water quality of this lake are, are so important to our state and, the, and Lake Champlain. So don't minimize a small program. Don't minimize minimize it. It's really important. And I don't know how UVM can say they're an environmental institution and then got a program that is so important. I'm going to stop now. But anyways, thank you all for allowing me to be here. And um, it's been really good. Thank you.